other wonderful programs and they will continue to do more wonderful programs with workshops and also historical talks like the one tonight. Um, as many of you know, we're, gonna, uh, we're having a program on data fluxes and other avant-garde art movements uh, that have been touched in Highland Park as well as the outside world, Rutgers, New York City, Europe and beyond. Um, we have a very rich history right here in Highland Park, and we're very happy to welcome um, Dr. Rafael Montez or tonight. Ortiz, I'm sorry, I always mangle everybody's name. And uh, Donna, uh, Dr. Donna Gustafson uh, from the Zimmerly Art Museum. Um, John Marin, who I'm going to introduce, will give extensive um, introductions to both of our esteemed. Uh, speakers tonight. Uh, John is, I, I think everybody knows John Marin, right? No, 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 no. <laughs> <laughs> He's the founding team yes, member of the Highland Park uh, Arts Commission, or, uh, I'm sorry, uh, Highland Park Artists uh, Collective. He is a um, also a member of the Highland Park Arts Commission. Uh, he is a uh, psychologist and uh, does other very helpful things in the community. And we're very happy to have him here tonight and be moderator for this wonderful program. Thank you both. Thanks, Val. We give Val a hand because of Val. Many others, this could not have happened in any way, shape, matter, or form. I, uh, I'm a member of the Highland Park Art Commission, and we have other members of the commission uh, here tonight. Uh, Perry Neri in the back, you can give a little wave out. That's Perry Neri in the back. And uh, Chris Young is hiding out somewhere. Uh, he was here, uh, and then, <laughs> right, right in the center. Chris is running our tech and saved Michael Heine today, uh, 16 times. I'm just going to give a brief commercial about the Highland Park Art Commission. Um, uh, this year we're doing autobiographical spoken word workshops. Uh, Amy Pollack is going to do another uh, book arts workshop here in this space in the library. She did two last year and they cost nothing, fully attended. They were, they were turning people away. Did we turn people away? Um, I'm gonna be doing a Zen writing and drawing class. Uh, we're gonna have music on the corner from May through September. Uh, the Buck Art Show, anybody ever heard the Buck Art Show? It, it's where you uh, are allowed to buy $10 worth of stuff from the dollar store to make your own piece of art and enter it in the show. Hopefully it'll be at the White Lotus space uh, May 22nd. And we want to encourage children of all ages uh, to <coughs> be part of that. We've done it in the past where we really get uh, a lot of parent-child turnout, so it's a pretty popular event. Uh, we'll have concerts by Raices, which is uh, uh, Afro-Cuban group. On Earth Day, the Art, Art Commission and others would be, would be happy to submit uh, posters on the theme of art at the Ecology Center on River Road on uh, uh, April 22nd. Uh, we sponsored six poets uh, who will be doing another uh, spoken word concert in the fall. And we paid the poets $100 a piece, which is very rare for poets. Uh, having been a, a poor poet my, myself most of my life. Arts in the Park will be in September, and we, we will have our booths there. Uh, the Window Art Walk has been really successful for the last few years, and uh, that will happen right one week before uh, Arts in the Park. City of New Brunswick started a much larger program called uh, Windows of Understanding, which was also in Highland Park recently in the Rite Aid windows and up and down Raritan. And they're uh, trying to do something that has more to do with uh, seeing through hate 
social engagement in these times where we're really trying to wake people up to issues of immigration, income equality, uh, minority rights, violence, uh, and, and various other climate issues. And so, uh, Dayan Huff, who from Mason Gross, is sitting over here. I'll embarrass her also. <laughs> she was a major mover in the Windows of Understanding show in New Brunswick, which attempted to bridge uh, the old Albany Bridge in, in, into Highland Park. Bigger and better next year. Am I correct, Nan? Yeah. Okay. <laughs> That's the right answer. Uh, lucky Joe Boscarino is designing a memorial a band aid bench, which may go along uh, the Rite Aid uh, store to commemorate Earl Dixon, who is the inventor of the band aid for Johnson and Johnson. Um, so that that could be uh, an element of humor and. Uh, really centering Highland Park <laughs> in the history of band-aids and world health. Uh, and then later, we expect this to be even more popular. We're going to do another panel that has to do with the children of Jewish chicken farmers who became artists. And I'm told by Marion Monk and Arlene, uh, Ellen Rebarber, Joe, uh, uh, Bill Jack Maloney is not here tonight, uh, but George Siegel, <laughs> Phil Orenstein, and others. Uh, Marion, who else went down to that big pro? Uh, th th there was a program in D.C. Yeah. Where you all at were the honored. Pacific Museum. Um, <coughs> oh, there were probably 50, pe 50 people. Because on the farms in the evening, you had plenty of time to start experimenting. Yes. So it was a, it was a show of both. Uh, formally educated and almost a folk art mm -hmm. from the communities. Yeah. Beautiful. Yeah. And Donna will talk more about how Fluxus also used <laughs> the opportunity of, of chicken farms and alternative sites. New Jersey is a non-site to uh, mm -hmm. build right. movements. And uh, Raphael might comment on that as well. Mm -hmm. I'm going on and on here. And then we're going to have a film. There's a woman, uh, Gertrude Dubrovsky, who wrote a book. I actually have the book here. I'll be flashing. Uh, the land was there, so it sort of tracks, you know, a Jewish diaspora that came over from Europe when you couldn't own land and came into Jersey and go, aha, let's, let's have a chicken farm. And then it led to a lot of other creative endeavors. So there's the film that goes with this. And I'll shut up and start to <laughs> introduce uh, Raphael. So I have the great, great pleasure of uh, getting to know Raphael and, and becoming a friend. Um, Raphael has created mixed media ritual performance and installations for museums and galleries in Europe and Canada and throughout the United States, including the Whitney Museum of American Art and uh, <coughs> Ortiz was a participating member of the Destruction and Art Symposium in London in 1966. His video, Dance Number 22, won the Grand Prix at the 1993 Locarno International Video Festival with Switzerland. In October 2013, the Hirshhorn Museum hosted Ortiz as a panelist and featured performance artist at their International Performance Art Symposium, Damage Control. Most recently, he was a recipient of the UCLA Medal uh, from the school's chancellor. His computer laser scratch video works are in numerous collections, including the Ludwig Museum of Cologne, Germany, the Smithsonian, uh, the Pompidou in Paris. His sculptures are included in many museum collections, such as the Museum of Modern Art, Tate, Whitney Museum of American Art, and he's twice been featured in the Whitney Biennale. Raphael Ortiz was the founder and first director of El Museo del Barrio in New York City in 1969. Well, Let's hear it. I've taken many school groups to the Museo over the years from New Brunswick, <coughs> and it just knocks kids' socks off to see what's, what's there. So I, it, there's so much more to say about Raphael, but at that, I'm going to shut up and turn it over to Raphael. <coughs>
Hi, everybody. Hi. Hi. Uh, it's interesting the discussion about uh, chickens. I've used a few in our performance. <laughs> <laughs> and I had a grandmother that had a basement full of chickens. Originally, uh, she went to one of these uh, pet stores. I was during Easter and they were selling these little chicks and she thought that'd be really great to buy about 20 of them and bring them home and have lots of eggs. <laughs> Except they were all roosters. <laughs> <laughs> so I remember chasing them around the yard. Um, I have, over the years, I, I segue all over the place. I have no problem segueing, you know, before you know it, you're hearing about my ingrowing toenail. <laughs> but um, I, in 1992, I sort of pulled together some ideas that I'd like to sort of throw out. In terms of the images, I, I just want you to sort of see them, peruse them. They'll change like about every six seconds. And uh, <coughs> you can always say the 40 second image, you know, and ask a question about that. So let me uh, start with, uh, and it's good to see uh, bits of Rutgers here. The aesthetics that guides my artwork has done so since my playtime from 1942 through 43 as an eight year old in the Lower East Side Rutgers place. Interestingly enough, I actually grew up in Rutgers Place, never imagined. <laughs> <laughs> I ended up at Rutgers. By the way, I, I am a real Highland Parker. I've been here 45 years or so, in case. Because I remember when I was in Colorado, there was this notion of, oh, they just come here to ski. <laughs> so, uh, and uh, my studio was a fence surrounded furniture strewn lot and an empty five-story building. My friends and I never dared enter, convinced it was haunted. I and my best friends would climb the wooden fence that enclosed the building and the lot. Our first concern was to drive out the ghosts that haunted the building by throwing rocks, each of us breaking a quota of at least five windows. <laughs> and no more. We needed to allow always windows to break. Only then was it safe for us to play in the lot. <coughs> Having completed the ritual and now safe from the ghosts, we could jump up and down and tear up the old weather beaten furniture and I could beat an old piano against the wall with a plumbing pipe. My favorite toy was an old battered upright piano I discovered leaning against the building's brick wall. It became my warrior's drum, when with a rusty plumbing pipe, I would drum it after the window breaking. It was within that first studio that my intuitive play therapy became the aesthetic that I would many years later reach back to as an inspiration for my future as an artist I am today. The form and content of my video film computer laser animation, sometimes called scratch video, revolves around my use of the first Apple computer with a variety of sound and image technologies. My computer programming design, making possible real-time computer interactive, nonlinear editing through interface with a video laser player, creating works comprised of a single or brief collage of deconstructed film clips, found clips, the sound layers of my work are the result of sound wave form generator manipulations. The image layers where they occur are special effect generator manipulations. In 1982, with my mastering Apple Plus and some machines, I think there was a focus here on the computer. Hmm. I, uh, I did enjoy working with it and have still recently worked with it in terms of painting collage. But um, let's go on to this uh, indigenous narrative. There we go. Uh, this, this stereotypic indigenous image and narrative, free to permit me to search in my larger existential history, 
in the broader spectrum of self-referred time and space and beingness, a representation and reculturation that will permit me an authentic and authenticating representation and individuation. A lot of academic stuff. <laughs> <laughs> the history of all culture is a shift from the expressed and the repressed, from matriarchy to patriarchy, from the all-inclusive to the all-exclusive, from the libertarian to the authoritarian, from the non-linearity to the linearity of all narrative, of all form and content. I have throughout my since uh, <laughs> I have to go out and break some windows. <laughs> the, uh, I have throughout my, since I was eight years of age in my corner junk filled lot, artistic behavior, however unconscious, I sought to organize, to ally myself with to conjure an aesthetic frame through which to release myself from such acculturation and repression as I outlined that Freud has called a surplus repression. Uh, my father was a fanatical Catholic. So my model for art making has been consciously culturally self-referential. A university educated American and European and Latino ancestry, different like each of us, is different from other artists who earlier sought, who now seek to authentically re-enchant their culturally disenchanted creative impulse. Historically, it is the same search and expression of the creative impulse that the indigenous everywhere thousands of years much earlier first fully realized. The term fully realized is here of special importance since what is meant extends far beyond the familiar history of stereotypic images of the indigenous shamanic world of the past. What I speak to here is an indigenousness, a shamanism, an existential individuation beyond any dimensional notion of time, beyond any dimensional notion of space. What I speak to is an indigenousness whose imagery, reconciling processes and events can be drawn from all time and space. Its outcome is an expression and organization of the creative impulse that permits a way of being and perceiving inherent to implicit and explicit to the world of enchantment. It is a model of indigenous beingness wherein one can choose to reach into the past, even divine a future with the condition that one does so through the present. Keeping in mind that we are serving our present, a present that remains ever present, however submerged, however deconstructed, into the past and the future. The new configuration, whatever the time and space of the reculturation, the moment of awakening will be a present. It was this world of the indigenous shamanic that the European culture first and the European American culture later appropriated in their artistic inventions, in modernism, in Dada, and my deconstruction in art, as artists sought to realize from classicism, from surplus repression. And so I simply continued destroying lots of furniture <laughs> and uh, playing pianos with axes. I found the axe to be more interesting than the plumbing pipe. Um, <laughs> and other performances and other works and video and computers and so on. Any questions? How did you hear about the girl? Why are you doing this? I uh, became faculty at Rutgers University yeah. and I got fed up with traveling back and forth, uh, trying to find parking space after I left it all night. <laughs> And I lived uh, uptown near uh, Lincoln Center. And uh, <coughs> I had a few faculty friends that lived here. And they suggested, why not move to Highland Park? It's a friendly place. And so that's what I did. And I've been here all that time. Rented for about 10 years. 
Then uh, my wife and I bought a house and uh, settled in very comfortably. Just out of curiosity, do you play piano? <laughs> <laughs> That's what I do. <laughs> <laughs> I, uh, you, the more traditional piano playing. Uh, yeah. Yeah, when I was about nine years old, I, I was a member of the Henry C. Settlement, mm -hmm. if anybody knows the Lower East Side, yeah. and mm -hmm. the EDGES, the Education Alliance, also. I was a member there when I was very young. And that's where I learned to shoot pool, play basketball, play oh, piano really a little things. bit, and uh, play the harmonica, and things like that. That's one part of your life, things like that. Where did you learn to use the axe? <laughs> <laughs> well, I went camping. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> and uh, the. I'm sort of an interesting character in terms of, well, I was an older boy in the High Episcopal Church and the Catholic Church, and then I, I served at, at the temples uh, during the holidays, taking care of all of the Candle. kind of things that um, somehow were uh, missed, and I filled in. So I, I took on all those sins. Uh, mm -hmm. um, yes. Can you tell us something? Yeah, yeah. Oh, yes. Uh, Again, I, I grew up in, in a Russian Jewish Orthodox community. Um, my family lived in Williamsburg uh, first, and uh, for until I was about two years of age, and then that family sort of broke up. And uh, my mom's older sister was living in the Lower East Side. Uh, she was a seamstress, and uh, she. Uh, told my mom about the apartment that was available in her building. And so when I was two years old, I moved to uh, Rutgers Place and uh, lived there for about eight years and then moved to Henry Street uh, and then Broome Street. And so in other words, that was still in, in terms of environment, in terms of the pogroms out in, in Russia. It was a, a huge Russian uh, Jewish Orthodox uh, community. Um, from from Williamsburg moving into the Lower East Side. And uh, I believe we were the first Latino family on the Lower East Side. And uh, so I learned, I, I, uh, I mean, it's kind of kind of a strange thing to say that all of my friends were, were their parents were Jewish Orthodox. And uh, however reformed some of them spoke, and but it was, for me, a familiar, uh, way of thinking about creation and one's creator and so on that, that contrasted <coughs> with uh, what I was experiencing as a uh, high Episcopal altar boy and Catholic and church old boy, which was kind of split. My father was high Episcopal, my mother was Catholic, and so I had to satisfy both of them. <laughs> but I was, I was in a Jewish Orthodox community, so I felt I had to satisfy my relationship with Judaism as well. And uh, that, that's what that's about. But, uh, yes? Could you say more about the Kabbalah? Because there were a few slides earlier. Yes. And, then, and then you had showed me something on the Tree of Life when I was at your house. Could you say a little bit about that? Yes. Um, of course, I, I, I had a, a relationship with a number of rabbis that um, since I was working in the temple and, and doing things with lights and so on, um, and there would be discussions about the uh, creation and so on, and then finally the Kabbalah came, came up. And I was very young then, but I would hear these conversations going on between rabbis, and, and interestingly enough, uh, they would, for whatever reason, when I was around, they would speak in English instead of the Hebrew. <laughs> <laughs> so I felt it in a sense that, you know, I was like, hey, I and uh, I also began to understand certain relationships that uh, 
there are a lot of personal stories. I mean, I could tell a per I think this might be interesting because as an artist, I have no shame. <laughs> so, uh, I was, my aunt uh, was always arguing with my mother as to why I wasn't circumcised. And they used to argue all the time, and, and I would, you know, hear about these arguments. And my, my aunt uh, would take out this uh, Bible, and, and uh, she opened it up, and there was, uh, well, this is another homage to the children of Treblinka. Um, so, that, uh, that in itself was, was kind of fascinating. And, and uh, when my aunt was dying, uh, my mother finally consented to have me circumcised. Mm -hmm. Now, I'm sure there, there are all sorts of implications and all sorts of assumptions that can be made from that, but there I was being circumcised. And uh, so from that, I, <coughs> I sort of decided that that reasoning must have some basis in some kind of reality. And, uh, and I, I did some research and uh, my mother spoke about new Christians and so on uh, that, that came out of her discussion with her older sister. So um, that, that explains that for me the, the Kabbalah became an important uh, connection spiritually uh, with, with uh, I somehow sense to be a, a culturally, and like it didn't seem like an accident why I grew up in a <coughs> Russian Jewish Orthodox community going from Williamsburg into Rutgers Place, into Broome Street, mm -hmm. into Henry Street, and so on. Mm -hmm. um, and so that, that uh, is, is my, in a sense, embracing my sense of a larger cultural sense, a religious sense, you know, cultural. Yes. Uh, I'd like to uh, ask some questions about uh, taking an axe to pianos. Mm -hmm. And uh, um, it seems to me that destroying a piano with an axe can be done pretty quickly. Mm -hmm. Um, in contrast with the building of a piano, which mm -hmm. isn't quick at all. Mm -hmm. And um, uh, so I think that my question is this. Did you or have you familiarized yourself with the... Uh, Architecture of the piano? And the building of the piano. Absolutely. And the materials that are used. Oh, yes. <laughs> Absolutely. Yeah. And uh, th there is an, an entire aesthetic frame with, within which... Uh, I, I do, in a sense, organize my res relationship to the piano. It's it's a sacrificial process. It's it's uh, the piano represents a reconciling, um, reconciling that that is within the, the shamanic tradition of uh, of finding some uh, context with it that is a certain kind of importance that you then s s uh, sacrifice something that you give up. Uh, and the, the piano, then for me, for instance, I, I suggested at one time that, that pianos be sent to war instead of people, <laughs> you know, things like that. Uh, in other words, it became, because of its complexity and because of its pulling from, from nature all of these materials, to dominate those materials, bring them all together to create this amazing machine that then we had to surrender to. Okay, and then of course culturally there have been all sorts of reactions to that surrendering and you know, improvisation, jazz, all of those uh, variations that, that come out of that. For me then the, the piano had a, a purpose beyond that familiar cultural purpose of rebel, you know, rebellion. But for me the, the sacrificial framework, you know, I read Leviticus, I did lots of research uh, within the Aboriginal cultures and so on. I have a great grandmother that's uh, Yaqui, so uh, Mexican uh, Indian Yaqui, and, uh, and and now she didn't run around with a loincloth. She was a college graduate, some. But uh, in search 
uh, for a more authentic sense of myself uh, and within as an artist, where I would be asserting uh, a roots that were less Eurocentric, that would, in a sense, give integrity to this sort of ancient connection that I, I felt I needed to search and, and get hold of. The, the piano was the bridge then between the whole notion of civility and the ancient cu uh, culture. And so the, the piano, in a sense, was an affront also within orthodoxy, you see? And, and, and so that relationship to the piano is a concert, in a sense that the sounds giving voice to that piano so that it represents this, in a sense, uh, reconciling and bringing, releasing from the piano all of those materials so that their sense of identity is more like their original identity of wood and wire and cast iron or aluminum and so on, and plywood and all of those kind of elements back. And, and then to give integrity to that process so that it is an installation, it's a, there's a fallout. <laughs> so that those pianos are in a lot of collections and a lot of museums. And, and concerts that were performed specifically within this framework. Let me ask you a pointed question about uh, the piano. Um, the pi a piano is composed of different materials. You're, you're quite right that there's uh, there's uh, metal strings, uh, but many different kinds of wood. So my mm -hmm. my pointed question is this. The soundboard of a piano, for instance, yes. would you know uh, from what species of tree the soundboard is constructed? Uh, no, I have no idea, but I do know the sounds that are possible with it. It's the Sitka spruce, mm -hmm. and it's, it's, uh, it's selected because of its uh, uniform and, and, and beautiful characteristics, mm. and uh, it's a magnificent tree. And uh, uh, I'm kind of in awe of just that idea that that particular tree provides the piano with uh, its heart. Mm -hmm. And it, uh, I'm just kind of uh, affronted, frankly, about destroying something like that. Yeah, you know, like I say, uh, send the pianos to war. <laughs> no. Do you think that would piano. stop war? Get a divorce from your piano. What? Do you think that would stop war if we sent the pianos to war? Absolutely. <laughs> Everyone would sit around and wonder, what do I do with this instrument? And uh, start playing it in all sorts of different ways. And appreciating the materials that it's constructed from and so on. And taking it apart and putting it together. The kind of things we, we do as children with toys. You know, that kind of naive sort of relationship and displace uh, the idea of, of even taking something apart that was precious. I mean, certainly life is very precious, and we take it apart uh, without much thought. Thank you. There are seats in the front if anybody's waiting out in the back. Okay. Yeah. I wonder, given your connection to the metaphysical and the spiritual, <coughs> if there's anything that you've created, any of your pieces that you feel have protected you or blessed you in your in your process. Good question. Mm -hmm. um, an interesting question. The, the only thing I can think of um, was uh, participating with my wife in designing uh, some of the jewelry uh, where the value of the stones, their meanings, their astrological <coughs> meanings, their cultural meanings. Uh, and it's interesting you asked that question, but this is a a piece of jewelry that we designed together. And uh, when she found the crystal with the Star of David on it, I don't know if you're familiar with this crystal. And uh, th there are certain Central South American beads, and so on. And there's a knotting technique that's used uh, in parts of Central America. So this, for me, I've always worn it for over 20 years. 
and uh, as a work of art that for me uh, coming out of the love of her and with her that that is for me protective I just like to say that Monique also has a beautiful piece of art that's right in the center of the library one of my favorite <coughs> pieces of art in the library so you might check it out on your way out still here it says family on it I yes. guess. Um, I wanted to ask a more abstract question, if I, if I may. Um, move like, <clears throat> if I can lump in the, the performance art category, things like Dada and Fluxes mm -hmm. and things, um, how would you think we should um, commemorate moments like that or things like that and, and take into account the contributions that they have of, of the ability to bring art like, to the people instead of people having to necessarily go into another world? Like, how would you think that we should commemorate things like that? Could you be more lucid? It's <laughs> <laughs> Ben. Um, well, I'm actually um, I'm here for ulterior motives. I'm working on a uh, I'm in a class and we're we're studying historical markers, and so I'm thinking about how um, one might try to construct a historical marker for something like an art movement. And, you know how because if you couldn't do the same thing that you would well for something with a in plaque. 1966 a uh, number of artists in Europe and here in the States uh, came together uh, and looking at art and trying to uh, draw conclusions moral ethical conclusions about the fact that most of the time uh, we were involved in art in a kind of nice meditative way that you know uh, to the extent that we can get away in a quiet place and, and do watercolors and oil paintings and whatever collages and so on. Uh, we decided that we needed to begin to understand that the art process in itself is, is a behavior and that that behavior has certain moral ethical meanings and that the way you do something and what objects you use and what meanings you give them emblematic and so on to what extent do they relate to the struggles that are going on within the society? At that time in 1966, we were all protesting apartheid. We were also protesting war. And so we came together in London in 1966, and we had the Destruction in Art Symposium. And in that symposium, all of us presented our papers at Africa Center. It was an interesting conference. Uh, beyond that, we all did demonstrations and performances <coughs> but all in relation to a protest to these inhumane behaviors. And, and those works that I did uh, with the, the shoes, uh, the first piece was the, uh, anyway, they, they were my a, a attempt to, to make clear that, uh, that the artist should integrate into their process situations like, like the insanity of the Holocaust. And, and beyond that also then for instance there's the apartheid and there is, you know, slavery and indigenous exterminations and, and so on. How does an artist then in terms of the, the subject the, the form and content of the work and the process able to, to make that bridge so that the artwork uh, is not just simply viewed as uh, and this doesn't in any way eliminate the notion of beauty or ugliness or and so on. The, the question is not, not looking at the surface of it because this is one of the problems of looking at a lot of the uh, appropriation of the indigenous cultures uh, that led to modernism, which was ignored because of the uh, lack of complete, uh, un any understanding of the cognitive processes that underlied it and, and all of the thousands of years of investment of meaning to color and form and so on, that, that became in a sense sacred rather than just simply, uh, it's fun, okay? And, and the Destruction Art Symposium, I think, is an example of, of that. We, we also have the example, certainly, of, of, the, of Dada. But Dada more, had more socialists and, and more uh, 
progressives and, and communists and so on concerned with social change, whereas, for, for instance, surrealism had more uh, uh, sort of elitist, uh, upper class concerned uh, artists. Uh, you, you see the, the relationship between the Nabis, uh, for instance, which were uh, uh, Jewish artists that came together to ex express in a, in a kind of very sensitive way the idyllic, you know, life that's, that's desired versus all of the anti-Semitism that was, you know, in a sense interfering with the, that happening. So, for me, there are, if you study art movements carefully and try to understand the sociological basis of it and the, and the beliefs of the artists themselves, and how that uh, arrives and, and moves through the way they work and the subject. Not so obvious always, such as playing a piano with an axe is not so obvious, you know, within the sacrificial framework, the reconciling. Does that help? Yeah, yes, very, very much. Yes. I've been thinking about other modes of sacrifice and destruction that aren't as that I haven't seen represented so you're talking about physically break or I've seen images of you physically breaking apart furniture and pianos and uh, with axes and revealing the insides and breaking apart the pieces but there are other modes of destruction that are also cultural touchstones like um, burial or fire or like drowning and I'm wondering if there's if um, you've had any thought or worked with other artists who have approached destruction using those uh, using those as cultural touchstones instead of you know, physical breaking apart by yourself. Well, I, I would maybe come a, a step earlier. Uh, the 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 formation of, of the fetus, the, the, the birthing, the, 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 you know, there's this constant making, unmaking, is the construction, destruction, it's all and built together. But if there's anything to concern ourselves about is to what extent we uh, understand how valuable life is and how precious it is. That, that's the most important thing. When, when, you're, when you're chewing on a, a leaf of lettuce, you don't hear its screams. Uh, or when you are digesting a, a piece of steak, you know, you don't hear the, you don't think of the cows and so on out there <coughs> hammered across their skull. And you understand, it's, it's part of the social framework already. It's, it's part of our livedness. The question is, to what extent we can, within it, make it move towards a more sacred sort of context where life is uh, understood to be precious and that you, you want to, and you understand also that we are seven million years old and we still have parts of our chimpanzee brain that, that's ancient there as well as the prefrontal development which moves us from Australopithecine into sapiens sapiens and that we no longer in a sense eat each other okay but we still do a lot of damage to each other thank you Raphael? Yes. Can you talk a little bit about um, how do you transition? You know, it seems almost after the show in 1966, you start the museum. You, uh, you know, what's the transition from practice, you know, this immersion in the, the world as an artist, coming here soon, right, as, as a teacher, and then starting the museum? How do you, you know, what, what's the relationship between all of those different modes, different practices, and how do they relate to each other? How they inform each other? Um, I reference my, my experience as a child, where where the the Jewish community <coughs> was always in that process of wanting to re recapture, to reconstruct, to reassert. Uh, all of that uh, became part of 
uh, my conversations, my discussions, my sense of, in a sense, being the only Latino family who then, my mother would send me to the barrio uh, for, during the summer for a couple of weeks to have fun with my cousins. And, but all my cousins belonged to gangs, right? So they taught me how to make a zip gun and things like that. <coughs> and uh, how to uh, Molotov, you know, cocktail, and you know, things like that, that when you see people that you don't like, you, you know, you sort of throw it and you run. <laughs> and, uh, and you have to run fast because they're gonna throw things back and so on. Uh, and so I, I then had an, an opportunity because I, I got involved in reading and being interested in, in uh, Getting going to college, and because all of my friends were reading, they wanted to go to college. They wanted to be uh, professionals, whether it was in law or you know uh, teaching, and so on. And some of the most important influences in my life uh, were within that experience. You know, the most maturing aspects. So. There I, there I was, uh, in a sense, also saying, you know, everyone was saying, well, aren't you going to go back to, you know, to the barrio, aren't you? And I would say, no. <laughs> I said, everybody should leave the barrio. You, you know, we should eliminate poverty. It should be, you know, anyone that contributes to poverty should be fined, like, you know, when you park your car in the wrong place and stuff. And there should be a list of fines while you participated in, in creating this amount of poverty, and this is the fine, right? So then, then for me, uh, the the like, Puerto Rican community needed to have some integrity. <coughs> I felt that, that there was no sense, no cultural sense, and no integrity that I saw in in the uh, Russian Jewish, you know, Orthodox Jewish community. There's a lot of integrity within the the foundation, the cultural foundation, and the wanting to sustain it, and so on. And so all that I brought into the context of what the Puerto Rican community needed in, in that barrio. It, its culture needed, however folky, because it all begins as folk culture. Even when you, you are listening to classical music, you think, oh, it's very highly and refined and so on. Meanwhile, that composer was influenced by a lot of the folk rhythms and folk culture. I mean, it, it's... And so the museo happened, in a sense, without my consciously deciding, someday I'm going to organize a museum, and I, it will serve to give integrity to the culture of, of the Puerto Rican within the patio, which is different from the Puerto Rican that's listening uh, to Beethoven and so on. Uh, the, because who has a university degree. We're talking about, like my family, everyone would say, oh, you speak Spanish at home. I said, yes, we speak uh, third to fifth grade Spanish. <laughs> well, because my father dropped out of school when he was nine years old during the Depression, and my mother managed to get on to junior high school, and she had to drop out and go to work also. And so, and within the family, the whole notion of disenfranchisement and underclassness and how that leaves you with a kind of colloquial sense of the world and your language. That, for me, uh, I, had to, I had to find a way to serve the evolving of that, to give integrity to it, but to, to, under, to serve the evolving of it. It's a huge jump. Yeah. You know, to do that. And you know, was, was there a community? Were you working with others at this time? Was this, no. Like, was there a shared voice? And no. It was you. It was me. And when I spoke that way with my cousins, they wanted to kick the crap out of me. <laughs> <laughs> Did you have any Latino role models at all? Uh, Heroes, so to speak, that you could learn and raise yourself up from, other than the Jewish community? Uh, no. Well, yes. My uncle, Mieves, he was an artist. Oh. And he used to travel uh, all over the place. And wherever there was a, uh, a, a Latino grocery, well, he's within that language, bodega, he would do the murals mm -hmm. of the uh, 
Taino culture and the Oyos and all of the uh, those days of just hanging out before Columbus. And uh, he used to uh, visit at, at home and everyone oohed and odd because he would show some of his drawings that he uh, had, in a sense, attached to these large panes of glass that we see as we approach these groceries and supermarkets and so on. And uh, he also brought some amazing uh, glass, uh, oh, about like that, of, of these schooners with the Puerto Rican flag and the ocean, beautiful schooners. And he used to paint them in reverse, which fascinated me. He'd work with the highlights first and then move towards the front. So it's the, it was all kind of amazing. Anyway, he used to come and everyone knew that and they wanted him to draw their portrait. <laughs> and they would all pose, you know, and, and, uh, and he, would, he would tell them, stop moving around. <laughs> Sit still. You know, they would, he would say, put your arm back where it was. And I used to watch that. And I remember people would always tell me to be still and be quiet, but it was not like they were drawing me. It was just this, you know, come on, you brat, shut up. <laughs> so I then asked him, uh, in sort of in a corner, I said, Uncle Nevis, would you uh, teach me how to draw? He didn't quite know my motive, but my motive was, and I did, he gave me some paper and pencil, and he said, draw. Just draw anything, anyone. Of course, I had my piece of paper, my pencil, and I would tell my, my uncle to sit still, and he would say, get out of here. <laughs> <laughs> but as my drawing improved, as things became more and more realistic, in the sense of <coughs> improvement, and that's, that's another cultural value, but it's another issue. And uh, they, I found that they would sit still for me. And that was a powerful thing for a child to tell a grown-up to sit still. <laughs> I said, I've got to pursue this thing. <laughs> Question? Yes. You talked about your early experience with the, the lot that you used for your playground and your beginnings of your destruction with the windows. So how do you, how did that develop further into your current state of destructing things? Uh, in, in Germany, in Cologne, uh, I had a show, and, and I, I did specifically want to deal with that, and I got these large panes of glass. One of the things I did is some research, and one is that angels of, of infants and children that die in shock, they, they go to crystal, and they, they go to panes of glass, and they, they are there, you know, within that crystal structure, uh, comfortable. And that the only way that they could be rele released was within a certain ritual context to shatter the glass, okay? And so, for me then, that harkened back to the ghost. <coughs> and, uh, and the idea then of creating this large structure of glass which people at the, who came to the exhibition could shatter. That was that, pulling that together into that particular uh, piece. I also then included the shattering glass sound within the piano destruction sounds as well for another layer. I started thinking of layers. Were you chasing your fears? Always. Because I mean, we're the only culture, we're the only culture who, into our old age, is still being chased by demons and still frightened. And, you know, the Sonoy of Malaysia, like at the age of six, they're sitting around the table and, uh, and they said, tell, so tell me about your dream. And, uh, and, and this child says, well, this tiger chased me and I was so scared and I woke up and I was, you know, trembling. And, and then the, the older brother, who happens to be 10 years old, says, no, 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 that's not the way to deal with uh, tigers. 
Now, when you're dreaming about a tiger chasing you, you're supposed to tell, turn around and tell the tiger, hey, you know, you can chew my arm off, but it'll grow right back. You can kill me, but I'll come right back to life. And guess what? You're going to have to serve me for the rest of your life. And so what happens then in Malaysia and amongst the Sinoi, when they have a, like they have to build a bridge <coughs> uh, across a certain chasm, and you know, you don't call up and bring the local mayor to bring the engineer in, you know, kind of thing. You have to work it out yourself. So what they do is they, there's a project. They all go to sleep and they dream to talk to ants, spiders, weaver birds, all of the constructing things in nature. And, and then in the morning they all meet like this and they all talk about the dream they had and the idea they have to contribute to building that bridge. Very different. No mon the monsters are all gone, they're all serving. <laughs> The tiger, you talk to the tiger, you say, look, there's a festival coming up, I'd like to do a dance, you know? Uh, how about, a, can you teach me a tiger dance? <laughs> and so, the, in the dream, you learn the tiger dance, and then at the meeting, you demonstrate the tiger dance. Everyone applauds you for, you know, bringing the tiger dance to the festival. Very different. <laughs> When I was younger, I was a pyromaniac, and I spent about 10 years making elaborate fires with <coughs> gasoline and gunpowder and explosives and paraffin, and uh, uh, my sister's uh, uh, hairspray bottles, which were very nice rockets. Mm -hmm. uh, and I noticed that some of your works involve fire, mm -hmm. and the ones that really moved me were the ones, which I believe you said to me were uh, shoes of children that actually were in Treblinka or... Yeah. Could you talk a little bit about your approach to fire? Well, I mean, that's just alchemy. That's earth, air, fire, water, ether. Mm -hmm. You know, each of them. And, and if you know acupuncture, you know that the whole body is structured along those terms of, and the meridians, uh, in, instead of saying particularly like liver and heart and so on. They're all related alchemically to one of these elements, and that the elements are either too much or too little of that element. Mm -hmm. And so, you know, that's called the, 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 the chi issue and so on. And how do you soften the, the too much chi here, and how could you elevate the chi there, and so on. All, all of that, um, I had, I had uh, an uncle who was Chinese. Uh, <coughs> my aunt was the only Puerto Rican waitress in a Chinese restaurant, <laughs> and and she and the uh, the head cook hit it off, and so I had a Chinese uncle. <laughs> and and uh, I lived with them for two years when my my father enlisted. He didn't have to, but he enlisted in the Second World War and just got into the invasion, you know, Normandy and so on. And it's interesting because he didn't have to. He, when he went in to enlist, they said, uh, excuse me, but you, you're, you're a father, you have two children, you're, you're married, uh, you don't have to be here. And he said, no, I have to be here. I have to be here. And, and, uh, you know, however hostile that might sound, but, but I mean, he just said, I have to kill Nazis. So, mm -hmm. that's what he had to do. Mm -hmm. So, uh, anyway. So, is the element of alchemy in, enters into it a little bit for you? Well, way? alchemy is, is part of the Kabbalistic structure. Yeah. And the uh, alchemy is, is just another, another way within chemistry, instead of naming a particular event, you know, with all of its chemical parts, you, you break it down into these elements, earth, air, fire, water, and so on. And each of them have particular powers in, in combining with others. It's, it's a, another kind of, of way of, of breaking things uh, down uh, in a, in a and in the process, have a sense of sacredness in the process. 
nine, so alchemy is, uh, but that's not what those shoe pieces are about. They're not about alchemy. They're Remembrance? They're or about murder. Murder. Mm -hmm. So. Any other questions? I don't want to dominate. Cause I, I just I have um, I go to Jose del Barrio in New York a lot. Do you still attend there a lot or? No, no. I I <laughs> I advise periodically. Okay. You know, I get up on the phone and yell and complain. <laughs> okay. So they're gonna they're gonna lift me up and and uh, hold me above the crowd with the next uh, the the 50th gala, which is the one after this one. Mm -hmm. Uh, and so I'll be celebrated then. And I'm going to insist that they finally get the bronze plaque that puts me down with the founder, and first director. You know, and not in the bathroom. Can you go back to that slide with the feathering yeah. objects? Oh, yes. <coughs> that dream time. Yeah, I had, I had, uh, there are a number, the shield also is part of that feather work. Uh, I, I used to have these dreams that I was um, in this place that was like, because I had done a lot of research with the Mayan and the Aztec and the Toltecs and, and so on and so on. And uh, so I, I had this dream where I was uh, amongst the, the Olmecs and the Mayans and so on, and I was the go-between the priest class and the crafts yeah. people yeah. Who, who build, uh, who build the, the, uh, s these spiritual objects that were then, uh, in a sense, used within the ceremonies. Uh, and and I, I would uh, bring diagrams of, of <coughs> what needed to be you know, built and what materials would they need so that they could be delivered. Uh, the fur, <coughs> they have a particular monkey fur, a particular leopard fur, what kind of bird feathers were necessary. They all had symbolic meaning. They all had these in very complex, uh, it's very much like when you buy flowers. You, you, you buy flowers and you bring them to this family and, and they slam the door in your face and you say, what? what? It turns out you brought a bouquet of flowers saying, I'm so glad he died. <laughs> you know, there are all these meanings that are given. There's a whole narrative context that, that we've lost touch with that is fundamental to the Aboriginal culture. Uh, however much uh, there are issues about uh, why, why organize an entire culture for so long a time within a sort of iconic, you know, indexical sort of referencing <coughs> and logic rather than move on to the uh, symbol, symbol, more complex, mathematical, intellectual, and so on. And my argument is, this is one of the issues with, I have with the, uh, the Taino in Columbus, that if the Taino hadn't wanted to retire so early to the countryside, you know, and, and uh, just sort of hang out, and, and it was kind of easy, kind of, way of flow with nature and so on. If they had become, left the iconic and dexical, moved into symbol, symbol, and had the chemistry and so on, and metal and metallics, they would have met Columbus with helicopters. <laughs> that would have changed everything. Donna, <laughs> <laughs> you have a question? Well, I, I wanted Raphael to talk about these. I think this one How yeah. How they look? No, no, they're, they're they big. Big. Oh. Yeah. Uh, the, the, uh, the shield is about that size. Feathers. So that came out. There are more pieces. There were about a dozen pieces, and uh, some of them were sold here and there, and left here and there. And those were the few. There are two sets of the pyramids and the shield that I showed at Laxart just uh, some six months ago. I got a. I did a exhibition and performance there, piano piece, and, uh, and we did Humpty Dumpty also. Um, you know Humpty Dumpty, yes? 
<laughs> set on the wall. <laughs> right, so we did Humpty Dumpty and, and I gave everyone a, an egg with band-aids on it and the Humpty Dumpty song. And they climbed up a ladder and they dropped it onto this big drum that was amplified. It was all part of the piano concert and so on. And, and they would be singing Humpty Dumpty set on all. Humpty Dumpty had a great fall of resources and all that. And couldn't put Humpty Dumpty together again. I think it's appropriate. Okay. Yes. Um, I, I know that you and uh, Monique, I actually knew Monique before I met you. She introduced me to you. Um, an incredible, wonderful person, artist, uh, quilts, painting, I mean, you could say a whole lot more. And the two of you also. Scuba diver, Phi Beta Kappa, black belt in American martial arts. <laughs> <laughs> I never argued with them. <laughs> <laughs> and I know you collaborated at so many levels. And uh, and you mentioned getting married to her in a certain uh, right, uh, the, the, the flaming sword. Yeah, the, right. Can, can you say a little bit the about path that? path of the flaming sword and the tree of life. Uh, there, there are paths you can take in your life. And, and to the extent that you are disciplined and you follow that path, you know, there's certain prosperities and certain issues and certain problems you need to pay attention to in solving. And the path of the flaming sword was a really difficult one. And, and the way you do it is that you have the candles that are set up like the tree of life. And you, you then, t with a candle, you light the candles in the path and you, and you feel that flame. You both of us hold it, follow it. Uh, yeah, we used, uh, because uh, Monique's father was Jewish, and uh, he was uh, Polish, and uh, lived only because the family took him in. Uh, that, that happened often, and protected him. Uh, <coughs> kind of interesting. She said he, he can sort of told her the secret. That, that he was Jewish and that um, he, he knew all the prayers, um, important Hebrew prayers, and he knew all of the important Christian prayers. And uh, anyway, uh, he, he started, in, he married a, ca a devoted Catholic. And she has a brother as a result that's a priest who uh, trained at the Vatican. Uh, of the uh, religious law, it's really complicated. Uh, those were the priests who worked closely with the, uh, the crusades and uh, all the rationales for inquisitions and stuff like that. Anyway, when she grew up with this secret, okay, and, uh, but eventually he couldn't hold on to the secret too long and he told his wife kind of in, a, in some easy way he wanted to convey to her that, that he was Jewish. Uh, I mean, he, there are some personal things like he always had to explain why he was circumcised and stuff like that. So they divorced. But uh, she had this connection with her father, and she also <coughs> understood uh, her, her Jewishness. And uh, they, they were in touch for a while, and then suddenly the letters weren't appearing and so on like that, and her mother was tearing up letters and going away. And she refused to believe him. She felt that it was a device, a strategy to, s to get a divorce, to separate. Well, when he, he died, cancer uh, killed him. And uh, so Monique and I went to, uh, they were living in Germany at the time in Cologne. Uh, and uh, we all got dressed and we're going to go to the funeral. It's like they, uh, I should say, this is past the funeral. Where this is now where he's buried, mm -hmm. to the cemetery. And we're we're all we no no one's been there, and it's a long trip. And uh, 
And we go and we uh, are walking in, and and suddenly a brother who's dressed in, in the you know in Germany they dress not in, not in cities they they dress with all of the black and kind of thing. but he stops and he doesn't want to go in because the tombstones have stars of David on them. Mm. And, uh, and all of, and we walk through and all of the tombstones have the Star of David. And we go to where he's buried and there's a tombstone with the Star of David. Mm -hmm. and, and there's hysteria, like, you know, crazy things. And, <coughs> and Monique uh, had to, you know, calm down, you know, calm them down and gave a short lecture <coughs> on, uh, you know, which, which, which in her mind helped them to understand that, uh, in, in a sense, and, and this is an abstraction, okay, that we're all Jewish, you know, because uh, however you want to think of Jesus, he was this radical rabbi, yeah. you know, uh, it, it had nothing to do with what then it became. So uh, there was, I think she, because she was yelling loud enough, they quieted him. Uh, she was just amazing. She really? was just amazing. And the true collaborator for you, maybe not plus ultra. Right? We uh, we worked together for years in performance. Yeah, all over the place, in the country, in Europe. So, I wonder if, in closing, you could maybe suggest anybody in the audience, younger artists, you know, that we're not just doing this series to to dust off old tomes or old art movements, but so much of what You're not? <laughs> <laughs> I mean, I mean, Dayan can tell you exactly what's going on in Brooklyn, and, and David Martin, I don't know if he's still in the house, what's happened in the Chamber 43, uh, Chris Young, Skullboy, I mean, there's so many great artists in the room right now who are still working beautifully. But uh, taking us forward, you know, the, uh, the up thrust, of what you're doing, anything you would suggest, given some of the swirls of cynicism out there in the world, uh, for the audience going forward. If you were 21 today, what would you be doing? Don't forget to vote. <laughs> <laughs> and, and I hear the marches over the weekend voted hundreds of thousands of students. So that's good. Any parting shots, Monsoor? Explain yourself. <laughs> <laughs> any, 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 any parting words before we move on to, to Donna's presentation? I have a question. Go ahead. Do you believe in God? My old friend. <laughs> do you believe in God? Yes. You do? But you didn't ask me what that entails. Yeah, I'm, so, I'm sort of curious. <laughs> Okay, I'll give you a quick, <laughs> a quick. Uh -huh. God is not creation. Creation is separate, you know, like resonating strings. Separate. God is infinite space. Infinite space. No intention. No motive. Just waiting to embrace you when you move into that infinite space. In other words, you can't avoid God's love because that embrace of infinite space as you're in it, however you're coming apart or coming together in it, you have space everywhere inside every molecule. So God is everywhere. God is embracing us infinitely within that infinite space without intention, without motive. And we confuse creation with God. We think all of these volcanoes and these eruptions and all of these lightning bolts, that's God. No. It's not God, that's creation. You can see creation then as a... Um, I can use the term ally. But no relationship. No relationship. Creation is, God is infinite space. 
Now you you're much more comfortable with God as infinite space instead of creating. I just avoid and like that. Well, we all have a different. You know, I know. the whole idea of religion means alignment anyway. I'm very. I have all these problems with religion. <laughs> well, I, that's because religion often mixes up creation you know, and God, and it confuses us. Rafael Montañez Ortiz. PhD, Curator of American Art, Mellon Director for Academic Programs at the Zimmerly Art Museum. We'll talk about the history of the Fluxus Movement at Rutgers, ongoing influences of present-day art theory and practice in music, dance, theater, site-specific installations around the world. Dr. Gustafson will also screen a performance of the Zimmerly Flux Orchestra with Mason and Grove students led by Mary uh, Larry Miller in 2012. Uh, I also have to give a big shout out to Donna for her incredible social photography show, Objective Subjective, that just ended. And there are people in this room or in that show. Um, anybody else? Do we, anybody need to go to the bathroom or any? Uh, <laughs> Any housekeeping things we need to mention? Mm -hmm. Okay, thank you. One for the money. Yeah. So, uh, thank you, John. Thank you very much, Raphael. It's an honor to be on this um, panel. Um, so, and, so, of course, Raphael spoke to you all as an artist. I'm an art historian, so I'm going to speak to you as an art historian. And um, I don't have a personal connection to the Fluxus information that I'm going to hopefully impart to you all, but I have a uh, deep fondness for Fluxus. I, I love Fluxus as a, as a movement, and some of the people that I've come to know through Fluxus, which include people like um, Jeff Hendricks, and um, John Goodyear, even though he's not really a Fluxus artist, he's someone who's given me a lot of information about what went on at Rutgers and Fluxus at Rutgers. Um, so I thought I would talk about what Fluxus is, because I wasn't sure who would be in the audience and how many of you would even know what Fluxus was. Do any of you know? <laughs> I, I, um, I did. I did. I did have handouts at the front, but I think they already snapped up. But yes. Um, so, so I'm going to do two things. One is I'm going to talk a little bit about what Fluxus is. Fluxus was a movement from that started in 1962, and according to who you read, it either stopped in 1978 or it continues. So. Um, for our purposes, we're going to talk about it as continuing. So I'm going to talk a little bit about Fluxus and then a little bit about Fluxus as it was manifested as a movement at Rutgers in New Brunswick and especially at Douglas College. And um, some of that activity that is associated with Fluxus activity at Rutgers happened at George Siegel's chicken farm, which brings us back to the next panel, which will be about um, the chicken farms as a place of incredible creativity, I guess. Right? Yeah. So um, two things, two quotes that I think will help set the stage a little bit. So John Cage quote, art is everywhere, it's only seeing which stops now and then. I want you to sort of think about that, right? And then the second one is your <coughs> The natural state of life and mind is complexity. At this point, what art can offer is an absence of complexity, a vacuum through which you are led to a state of complete relaxation of mind. After that, you might return to the complexity of life again, 
it might not be the same, or it might be, or you may never return, but that is your problem. <laughs> and so one of the things that I think that that says about Fluxus is that it's kind of your problem, right? A Fluxus artists are doing what they're doing. You can either join them, or you can not join them. You can accept this, as Raphael very eloquently just said, this sort of openness and um, a space of infinite possibility, in a way, or infinite space. Um, so maybe if you could go to the next slide. So um, what is Fluxus and who is Fluxus? A lot of Fluxus revolves around this man, whose name is George Machunas, who is a Lithuanian-born American um, who was trained as an architect and was a, he became the sort of impresario of Fluxus. Um, he invented the name Fluxus. He started the first Flux concert. He organized all the Flux events that happened until he died in 1978, which is why some people mark the end of Fluxus to 1978, with the end of George Machinus. Um, he wrote a manifesto, so as has become a tradition in modernism, a manifesto announces a new art movement, right? So this was George Machunas' manifesto. And he wanted Fluxus to purge the world of bourgeois sickness. Okay. Um, purge the world of dead art, imitation, artificial art, abstract art, illusionistic art, and mathematical art. Purge the world of Europe. Handism, right? And what he really wanted to do was promote a revolutionary flood and tide in art. So there's there's a lot of um, revolutionary character in Fluxus. There's a lot of destruction of the past in Fluxus and starting anew. So a lot of there's a lot of connections between Dada, which was happening as, as Raphael was talking about much you know earlier, sort of right around World War One, and Fluxus. Um, Sort of takes some of that. And the, the other thing that, the positive thing that Fluxus wanted to do was fuse the cadres of cultural, social, and political revolutionaries into a united front and action. Okay. Those are very grand statements. <coughs> okay, we'll go to the next slide. So, what, what did Fluxus <coughs> actually become? What was it? It was a publishing house. It was a mail order system, and it was also a theatrical group. And you have to think of Fluxus as a group of artists creating objects that you could order through a catalog for a couple of dollars a piece, and they would mail things to you. This is 1962. So they were doing almost like internet mail systems through the United States Postal System. It was a pretty remarkable thing. Um, and they did theatrical performances. They were irreverent and repressible and revolutionary. They were very much embedded in everyday life. They were an international group of artists, and they were constantly in flux. They changed all the time. New people came in. Machunas threw people out for not behaving properly. They joined again. So there's always this constant mix of who's in and who isn't, who's part of the group and who's not. They were both political and apolitical. Um, and really, I think the best way of thinking of them is sort of anarchic, right? Just that anarchy in action is what Fluxus was in many ways. Um, they incorporated music, theater, vaudeville, poetry, visual art, film, <coughs> media. You name it, they were, were doing it. They did performances, they made publications. Um, and you, in a lot of ways, they were not sort of multimedia so much as they were intermedia. You know what I mean? So they tried to mix all media together rather than working in different medias. You know, sort of <coughs> they were also, I think, intersectional, meaning that they they just kept moving into different categories, breaking up, going back. Um, and Ben Gautier, who was one of the Fluxus artists, 
said that really fluxus is an attitude towards life. So very hard to define, but full of all of this kind of activity and um, uh, possibility. Could you go to the next slide? So then I thought I'd show you a couple of <coughs> historic photos of Fluxus performances. Um, there I am. <laughs> oh yes, in there. How great is that? And notice there are some pianos. connections <laughs> what you've already talked about. Here's a piano, there's a piano, and there's a group of, of people, including Raphael, working on these pianos, and what they're doing is destroying them. In Charlotte Mormon. In Charlotte Mormon. Do you want to talk about what you were doing in that one? Yeah, that's a symposium I organized at Chester Church. Uh -huh. uh, the second version of Destruction Not Symposium in 66 was in 68, which I canceled when uh, Martin Luther King uh, was mm -hmm. murdered. Mm -hmm. uh, and so that's her final <coughs> smash piece, uh, which she ended up smashing on the head of two protesters who came and wanted to stop the symposium and lay down on the table where she was going to smash the violin. And uh, she had closed her eyes and uh, he sort of snuck in and she came down and shouted it on his head and he ran around saying, I'll sue you or something. <laughs> Uh, but but that's uh, there, there are a lot of Europeans in there and so on and this uh, John Hendricks is is up there you can see him up yeah that's John, um, so John and, and there's uh, uh, Jeff's uh, wife at the time yeah oh, yeah there yeah um, who's that lady. Charlotte Mormon. This lady is Charlotte Mormon. She yeah. uh, liked to play the cello uh, nude. <laughs> this is a really interesting thing. She played the cello in a balloon up in outer space, <laughs> underwater in a diving outfit. Uh, she played the cello in a cello bag. Uh, fascinating. Yeah, she was a friend of mine. She Where did that take place? <coughs> Judson Church. Judson Church. In New York. New York. Yeah. Manhattan. Yeah. Lower East Side. Lower East Side. Mm -hmm. so, um, so this is a selection of photographs of Fluxus events that were happening between 1962 and 1965. Some of them happening in New York, some of them happening in, in Wiesbaden and in Copenhagen. Um, so it, there really were an international group of people. This one, this is a picture of, of Charlotte Mormon playing a single string using the back of Namjoon Pike as the instrument. Mm -hmm. um, they did a lot of collaborations together. Um, he made her a TV bra that she wore when she played the cello sometimes. Which some people say uh, was responsible for the cancer. Mm -hmm. Yeah, she died of cancer. Cancer. Breast cancer. Mm -hmm. She wore those, and they, they, the energy that those early televisions had mm -hmm. a lot of radiation. The, yeah, radiation. Yeah. And, uh, but this, this, I'm just going to, uh, because we talked about the destruction of the piano. Um, this piece that Charlotte Norman performed was, it was, um, I think, a piece that was written by George Brecht, and it was called. Uh, I forgot what it was called. I think it's called the violin. I want to think about that. But what would happen is someone like Charlotte Mormon or George Breck would come on stage and they would carry a violin on stage and then they would stand on stage and when everyone was focused on them, they would take the violin and slowly bring it up mm -hmm. over their heads and then at a very sort of dramatic moment would simply smash the violin down on the table or the pedestal, whatever was in front of them, and shatter the violin. Like, so many people were very upset about this destruction of the violins. Um, <coughs> Jeff Hendricks told me that they only destroyed violins that were, that were so badly made or 
were in such a state of disrepair that they couldn't be repaired. So no violin, no good violins were harmed. <laughs> 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 um, yeah. Yes. Well, by the way, uh, the nineteen fifty-seven. Elvis Presley destroyed a guitar that way on the table of someone who was harassing him while he was trying to do his, you know, uh, and so on, and uh, because he was trying to get a job at this cafe. And the guy would just keep talking loud and carrying on, so he stepped off the stage and just shattered it right there on the table. 1957. Mm -hmm. <laughs> okay, so um, a lot of these Fluxus performances were based on what were known as Fluxus events. And an event was a simple set of instructions <coughs> that lead you to the performance. For example, Alison Knowles um, had an event which was called Make a Salad. And that's it. So every time you made a salad, you were performing an Allison Knowles <laughs> event. Right? Yoko Ono had a piece that was called Breath Piece, and her instructions were simply to breathe. Right? Um, George Brecht had a piece called Three Aqueous Events. It was just ice, water, steam. Right? So one of the things that I love about Flux is, is it's about the absolutely forgotten moments of life, right? Flexus makes you pay attention to things, and, and um, it, it's, a, it's a very interesting thing to do once you start paying attention to things. Mm -hmm. Yes? Yoko Ono's famous piece is the cut piece. Yeah. Where she has people come up on stage, mm -hmm. and uh, I still have a little piece of cloth. Uh, and cut a piece of her clothing off and then go back into the audience with that piece. And that would happen until she was nude. And then she would uh, wrap, they'd wrap a blanket around her and she'd hold up a sign that says that uh, the nudity, nudity is her sin, something like that, very powerful mm -hmm. in time. Right. But that cut piece, uh, she performed at the Destruction Art Symposium, which uh, is what um, introduced her to John. Mm -hmm. Yes, yeah, so we can go to the next one. Um, so the other thing that Plexus was also very involved with puzzles, games, and um, for example, this is by Namjoon Pike, and it's called Zen for Film. So if you have ever seen this, <coughs> um, piece in action, so to speak. It is a completely um, blank piece of film that you thread into a projector and turn on the projector and all you see is like the flickering white blankness of this erased piece of film, basically. Um, and then, for example, George Breck and the other Flexus artists were always interested in, you know, mind games and puzzles. And one of their favorite um, little puzzles was called um, Spell Your Name Box. And what it would be would be a box filled with an assortment of objects and you had to figure out, it's like a rebus, you had to figure out a way to put these objects in order <coughs> so that it, they would signify your name in some way. So for example, if you put the dike, the E would be obviously a letter, four might be for an F, right, for the dice, um, different objects like a rock, or you know, that's how you had to figure things out. And George Machunas, would design these um, covers for each one of these things. And what he would do would be to ask the artist to come up with these puzzles, and then he would mass produce them in his Soho studio. And then, you know, you could write to Fluxus and say, I want a George Brett thing kit, <laughs> $4, please. And then George Machunas would put it together and mail it to you, and he would get it. 
I know, it's hard to believe. <laughs> Nobody wanted them. It's hard to believe. My dad mm -hmm. did. What? My dad did. He had a few of them. Oh, he did? He and did? Rest in peace to my father, yeah. Oh, they're worth a lot more than four dollars now. <laughs> <laughs> I'm a cheap little guy this life. Anyway, and then Yoko Ono's very famous white chess set, right? It's also a very, a very fluxus thing, right? Because chess is the game of war. If everybody looks exactly the same, how can you be fighting, right? So it's like a beautiful, simple solution to the problem. It's just like setting pianos to fight the war. Mm -hmm. Don't you think, Ruffin? Mm -hmm. uh, next. There are other chess sets right, by Takato Seito. This was um, a spice chess, so in order to figure out which was the knight and which was the pawn, you had to actually pick that up and smell it. <laughs> and if it was cinnamon, it was the knight. If it was nutmeg, it was the queen, you know. So, you, so it's really all about how well can you play a game if you have to not use your eyes, but your senses, right? And then this was sound chess. It was the same thing. There were different objects in each one of those little boxes. You had to pick them up and remember the sound so that you knew whether or not it was the king or the queen or the knight. What would make the sound? Well, so it was like sometimes there were like <coughs> little pieces of metal in there okay. or lentils or seeds. So mm -hmm. it's hard to did, did Marcel Duchamp ever sneak in the back of some of these boxes? <laughs> I'm sure he did. <laughs> Um, I don't know if you would have enjoyed playing this one. <laughs> we can go to the next slide. Um, and then I just wanted to show you, this for example is a picture of the flux shop in Amsterdam. It shows you all these fluxus objects <coughs> that were made, ready to be mailed out if anybody wanted them. The, the interesting thing about fluxus too was that fluxus was about everyday life. So you could buy fluxus stamps, you could buy an apron that was designed by a fluxus artist, you could design buy some placements, everything that you wanted for your home, you could get Fluxus style. Right? And um, George Machunas was really interested in Fluxus becoming an art for everyone. Right? It was cir circumventing the whole gallery system, it was a mail order system, artists directly to the audience. Right? So. Was he living in Amsterdam? No, he lived in New York. But there were fluxus outposts everywhere. Okay. He was also a realtor. Yes. <laughs> he sold it's most of the studios uh, in the Soho area. Okay. Yeah, he purchased the first artist building, he, and he wanted it to be an artist community. Really? No, he put, I mean, he put an ad in the village board. I mean, it was, it was not really good. Yes, he was. Well, he, yes, but I mean, he, he, he's I don't, I don't see that as negative. I don't see well, the realtor as something negative. So I'm, negative. I'm, uh, that might be a connotation. I, for him, the realty aspect of it was as much uh, an art process that related to his concerns. I know. I know. Yeah. It's, but it's I'm not, just saying that it was what was very effective was placing the ads and. Village voice, meet mm -hmm. at this corner, bring yes. your cash, yes. and you can buy a loft in this building. I mean, that was rather mm -hmm. mm -hmm. right. and very effective. Yes. How well did these shops do? Did they sell stuff? Not much. <laughs> <laughs> That's what I thought. They really didn't. They didn't make a living selling fluxes. Yes. Yeah. What is the difference between um, Dada, or Movement, and fluxes? Was it that? There was um, kind of more with games and with directions and kind of taking it outside the realm of certain objects and making kind of anything or at rat the Dadaism state. Um, well, you know, Dada, Dada um, was an art movement in Europe and maybe in New York like right around the First World War, right? Mm -hmm. And for a lot of artists, it was really a reaction against the horrors of the war. Mm -hmm. So it was, it was a direct relation to the world has gone crazy, you know, art should be in, in the same mm -hmm. realm. Or, it, you know, and it was a rebellion. So there's a lot of, a lot of Dada influxes, but Fluxus so is the next step 50 time. years later. Yeah in a different place, at a different time. Mm -hmm. 
Well, the Dadaist, uh, I saw fluxes as simply a kind of uh, soft, fluffy <laughs> Dada. <laughs> this, for example, is one of the Fluxus publications. You can order this. This is the yearbook or flux kit in year number one. It came in this little suitcase and you would unpack it. There were, there's a magazine, there were some boxes, some games, some puzzles, right? So for example, and then if you go to the next slide, the second one, um, oh, I, did, I took that out because I was mm -hmm. thought I had two slides. Okay. Right. So now we're going to fluxus at Rutgers. Um, so in the late 1950s, Douglas was the center for the art um, in school, right? There was no Mason Gross, it was everything happened at Douglas. And at Douglas was Robert Watts, Jeff Hendricks, um, George Brecht was a chemist who worked at Johnson & Johnson <coughs> and in the Touchen. Um, George Siegel was a student at Rutgers and a chicken farmer who lived, you know, down where he was on his farm. Uh, Philip Corner was a musician at Rutgers. Um, Alan Capro was teaching art and art, his art history at um, <coughs> Rutgers in New Brunswick. But he was associated with all of these people and he was a neighbor of George Siegel. Um, so in 1958, John Cage and David Tudor and the Paul Taylor dancers all came to Rutgers and did performances. Mm -hmm. And by that I really mean they came to Douglas and did performances. Um, in 1968, John Goodyear organized a show called The Gun Show. And um, when Dick Higgins, who was a member of the Fluxus group, heard about John Goodyear's show, he decided that we should, that the people at Douglas should really get the South Brunswick police to help uh, create the Thousand Symphonies by tying, and if, actually if you go to the next slide, I think I have a picture of it. By attaching, um, music sheets to these drums and allowing the police department to shoot mm -hmm. at these sheets and wherever and then Philip Corn and this is Dick Higgins carrying them there and wherever the bullet holes went through the paper that was what Philip Corner used to create his symphony and those were the notes mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. and then later Charlotte Mormon came to Douglas and um, performed as Philip Corner conducted the Rutgers Student Orchestra to play the Thousand Symphonies in 1970. So it's a pretty fantastic thing that happened here at Rutgers. And, and this New Jersey is non site, which was a show at Princeton back in the day. Right. It documents uh, many of these things. Mm -hmm. So I, I recommend this book. New Jersey is non site. And then if you go to the next slide. So then the other big thing that happened at Rutgers was mm -hmm. in 1970. Jeff Hendricks invited George Machunis to come to campus. And um, George Machunis organized the Flux Mass at the Douglas Chapel. Um, and as you can read, the clergy were dressed in gorilla suits. They served sacramental wine from a plasma tank with a large hose. There were no hymns, but there were the sounds of barking dogs and locomotives. Smoke bombs were used as candles. <laughs> and, um, a lot of faculty lost their job. Yeah, there was a big one. Mm -hmm. Is anybody there? <laughs> well, the term is did not get tenure. Right. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So it was a pretty radical event that happened here. <coughs> what year they redid it? Catholic Church. Sorry? Do you know what year they redid it? Because I was at the performance. Yeah, they did it again in 2003. Mm -hmm. Jeff out. Hendricks did it, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> so Jeff Hendricks organized a show called Critical Mass. And then the other thing that um, George Machunas organized was a flux. Actually, we go to the next slide. 
I'm sorry, this is such a bad slide, it's hard to get anything. He organized a flux sports event, which took place in the gym at Douglas. And then um, he also organized a flux art show where he um, created the floor of the exhibition space to look like a game board. And um, different stations were filled with Fluxus people who had their own artworks and you would just sort of interact with everyone as you walked around the game board, which was the, the art exhibition. So those were pretty fantastic events that happened here at Rutgers. Sadly, it's very hard to find any, any photographs of those. You don't have any photographs. Jeff Hendricks has some photos, but not too many. Oh, yes, please. Was there any protest of the Catholic Church's uh, criticism of the uh, Fluxus exhibit? There was a lot of, uh, well, they, I think That's all good. of the criticism was really based on the flux mass. Well, what I mean is, uh, was there any protest that. by faculty about the right of mm -hmm. uh, oh. expression and uh, yeah. not to be interfered with by outsiders? No. 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 Well, that destroyed a lot of careers. Yeah. But was the sin that it was in Boris Chapel, or was it just yeah. the, yes, the exactly. content? So just like Pussy Riot doing it in a church, mm -hmm. you know, yeah. two years ago, that's what really mm -hmm. got him thrown in jail. I, th I think it was the anti-Catholic mm -hmm. mm -hmm. sentiment. Al Hansen, who uh, was very uh, central also amongst the Fluxus, uh, we were in students together at Pratt, and we were the two sort of crazies. And, uh, he was doing happenings, hanging these sheets, and, and people had spray cans and stuff. And uh, Pratt also had a program that had uh, nuns who were uh, getting degrees in art, who taught art at the uh, parochial churches, uh, schools. And uh, a couple of the students wrote, you know, part of my French, you know, fuck God. Mm. And uh, so Al, uh, took a vacation, <laughs> forced. Mm -hmm. They said, come back in a year when you gain your sanity. Mm -hmm. And uh, he decided to just head to Europe. And uh, <coughs> in fact, that's where I get the call, you know, Raphael, this is up your alley of destruction. And I said, mm -hmm. I said, you too, Al. <coughs> so, and I like to work with fire. Kind of thing. Mm -hmm. but, uh, yeah, I, I mean, Jeff, Jeff Hendricks invited Herman Nitsch. Yeah. And uh, Herman Nitsch almost cost Jeff his job. Mm -hmm. Herman Nitsch liked to hang lambs around people and throw blood all over the place. And mm -hmm. so he decided to do that at Douglas. Yeah. Yes, yeah. can I? So I, I'm still trying to visualize all of this happening and how students exist within this because a lot of it's. For the most part, it's like faculty and like other adults coming and activating. So, how did students actually exist within all this? Were they more fewer watcher participant? Like, how much did faculty actually coexist with students as they're developing this? And was Douglas still all girl yes. at this point? So then, how did yes. that work? We actually have with, some all of, with all of that. Well, so uh, I'll just say something and then I'll I'll let. Um, those of you who were there talk. But um, from what I understand from talking to Jeff Hendricks, for example, um, the flux the flux mass took place <coughs> at this chapel and it was a, a it was a mandatory yes. plenary. Mm -hmm. So all the students were there. Mm -hmm. um, and some of them participated um, mm -hmm. and acted various roles, helped to create um, I think the bread, which was the host, was um, laced with laxative is what I heard. So there was a lot of um, serious stuff happening. Um, but the students were very much involved in the planning and in the performing and in, and in being the audience. And I think that was the case also in the flux sports events where, um, you know, and it was just crazy sports, like three people 
on one on two skis with their sh you know your shoes were like sort of glued to the skis and you all had to work together or running backwards and then running forwards or running with you know lots of balloons to hold your back like all kinds of of things like that but the students were very much involved in the planning and the students did a lot of the work because mm -hmm. this is really George Machunas coming down to Rutgers and deciding to do something he needed a lot of people to do the work to make it happen so mm -hmm. and those those were really the students right. I guess I was just thinking more on the, the bigger scale of like Rutgers is connected to Flexa so is it a part of the pedagogy of the school so it's like instructors <coughs> are like teaching their students that this is the mindset that we're having or is it like there is a movement of faculty who are part of the movement, and then by proxy, they're teaching students who are just, you know, students. Baron, do you want to say something about Jeff's teaching? Well, well, yes. Okay, please. <laughs> I adore him. I was with him from the first day that he ever taught, um, and that's almost 60 years ago. Um, this was a very transitional period, and the art students were also in transition. Some of them, including myself, didn't always understand what was going on with all of these events. Um, the others, I can't imagine what the other students, you know, art students are more used to going along mm -hmm. with what's happening. It was an all-girls school at that point. But I remember um, Bob Watts did a, an event <coughs> in New York that I was in with a group of my classmates at Douglas in the art department. And we were to spread a sheet in the middle of, I don't remember what avenue, maybe it was Broadway or somewhere else. And I'm not sure we understood what was going on. I did not understand myself. I just remember from that experience some man coming up and screaming at us because we were following <coughs> the directions of our professors. I remember that very clearly and I thought to myself, you know, he's got a point. <laughs> Actually, here I am willing to go along to do something. But we were art students. We were willing to do anything that was crazy. Mm -hmm. I grew up thinking, you know, I could do anything that was crazy <coughs> most of my life. Um, it may be hard to understand, but you know, it was a, it was a very transitional period. New Jersey College for Women which became Douglas in 1955, I think, um, went, we had a very important um, president at the time, Polly Bunting. She came from Bennington College, and she came with a very progressive, open idea about education. And Jeb Hendricks did too, his father. Actually, he grew up in a very progressive um, educational. So his, his father was actually uh, the headmaster of one of the better uh, private schools in New England. They were Quakers. They were Quaker, yeah. <coughs> and they were open to everything. But a lot of the women at Douglas were not. Mm -hmm. And they sat through it. And it was, there was a lot of, um, unhappiness and also a lot of excitement yeah it was a big deal mm -hmm. there's Jeff well and you have a person that behaves yeah. 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 yeah and Jeff um, did a performance the sky's the limit and for his chaplain in 1969 that's a photograph of it he, re, he did that again in Princeton um, mm -hmm. a couple of years ago. Yeah, about three years ago, yeah. four years ago. Yeah. Um, and there's one of his headstands for yeah. um, the 30th anniversary, the 30th birthday of Lexus. His signature. Yeah. Doing headstands. Doing headstands all around the world. Yes. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> okay, next slide. And you shall smile in the background. Yeah. Mm. Um, and here, for example, is Jeff Hendricks in memoriam to Charlotte Mormon and Namjoon Pike, um, which is a violin. It might have been the violin that Charlotte Mormon smashed, but Jeff saved and he, yeah, he put it back together 
and before he did that, he painted the inside of it with his sort of signature, which is these blue, a blue sky with white clouds, mm -hmm. which is this piece we own at the Zimmerle Art Museum. This is called Sky Laundry, for example. Jeff Hendricks was known as the Cloud Smith, and partly because he painted these blue skies and clouds over many, many things from a Volkswagen Beetle to a pair of old shoes to um, marble and sculptures, all kinds of things. Anyway, so this, you know, is like a sort of tender uh, memento to two deceased Flexus people, Charlotte Mormon, and then recently, non, more recently, non Pike. Um, and when, and we have this in the museum now, and what we do when we are folding it all up is this sort of silk uh, cloth gets folded in and the whole violin case gets closed. So it's like its own little coffin. Right? So maybe next time. We're running out of time. Then Bob Watts, he, he was the other very important fluxus <coughs> versus. This is a photograph of him. These are some of his events, some of his uh, games, puzzles, he made these like, stamps. He also did all these um, sort of references to TV dinners and, and other kinds of food stuff. Next he, slide. He designed the uh, performance structure uh, to be performed uh, after his death at the property that he owned, uh, mm -hmm. an old farm. Right. Yeah. Uh, that was quite an event. Mm -hmm. A lot of artists participated yeah. in that. Mm -hmm. Like 30, 40 artists. Mm -hmm. Which is that whole, there, there were flux divorces, flux marriages, <laughs> flux funerals. <laughs> Jeff's especially, they saw everything. Yeah. Mm -hmm. I mean, everything. All the furniture, <laughs> everything <laughs> was sawed in hand. <laughs> even, even there. Wedding album photographs. <laughs> that was so, and then Larry Miller was a, another a graduate of Rutgers um, in 1970, I believe. Um, so there's a Larry Miller uh, orchestrating a Fluxus concert at Lafayette College. This is his um, piece called Score, and then this is um, he also chess still important so he designed this fruit and vegetable chess this was a game that we had in the museum and we let people actually play this game <laughs> and i have to tell you that every week i had to go to stop and shop <laughs> 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 and but it was it was a very um, fun thing okay next one and then, you know, we did an exhibition in 2011, and this gives you, a, a, for example, these are some of the relics of the Flux sports events, right? So that's, those are those skis that people wore. Um, people played ping pong with frying pans or ping pong um, paddles that the center was cut out, right? anything that was just <laughs> <laughs> um, And then next slide. <coughs> and then we had Larry Miller come and do a um, performance with uh, with the students at Rutgers. Um, so I taught a class with Jerry Beacon, who's at uh, Mason Gross. It was a burn seminar, so these were all first year students, and we whipped them into shape. By the end of the semester, they were performing in the Zimmerle Art Museum to a standing room only crowd. This is uh, two of them. This is performing the audience piece, and then if you go to the next slide. This is another one of our students who is performing. This is all sort of pre-performance, and then if you go to the next. There's Jeff Hend Jeff Hendricks came back and performed. This is uh, Bob Watts' cut piece, which is basically two people unrolling a long ribbon, and then Jeff Hendricks came into the middle with the scissors and cut the ribbons. Um, and then Jeff doing his phone book of 19. <laughs> it's just a <coughs> telephone book, and every single page covered with shaving cream. He had about eight <laughs> bottles of shaving cream. <laughs> and then the next one, I think, um, if you can. Go. Keep going. Yes. Yeah. What? I hope. Yeah, we just, yeah, right there. 
You might have to turn the volume all the way up. Do you see the volume? So I thought I'd just give you a couple excerpts of the concert. So in, yeah, here's Jeff Horn. Instruments by Joe Jones. Is that related to this or no? no? 
just performance art Carole, in general? Carole, like Carolee did some work with Fluxus, but okay. she saw herself as separate. Wow. As a woman, because Fluxus tended to be mostly men, and uh -huh. except for Yoko and Charlotte. So these all perform does all performance art fall under the sort of Fluxus umbrella? Like no, no. no. Okay, good. That's good. Although I do want to say that Fluxus is the only art movement of the '60s that had more. They had more women in Fluxus than anywhere else. Because there were actually quite a few. Oh, yeah, yeah, that was Yeah, it was Alison Knowles, Doris
uh, theatrical and let's say poetic <coughs> analogs to this. Um, I was thinking of the douche contour in Europe, who seems to have this type of humor in, in the way he cuts up, uh, uh, what do you call it? Um, re uh, religion, politics, etc. So, what would be the literary analog to this? Well, for example, um, one of the Fluxus artists was Emmett Williams, who was a poet. <coughs> Is that, um, and, and, you know, his poetry, which I can't recite for you, because I, I can't, um, was often performed as part of the, you know, as a Fluxus event, but there's also a lot of, like, throwing out numbers, in sequence, and you know, it's hard to. Um, I'm, I'm not, I don't feel equipped to talk about modern poetry. I don't know if you do. But, you know, Jackson McLeod. Jackson McLeod, right. Lamont Young. Mm -hmm. I mean, people like that who were working with words and sounds yeah. and music, and so all of that, that's more, and Dick Higgins, mm -hmm. right, and screams and enunciations, you know, mm -hmm. so. And dance. Like, what's the difference between music and noise mm -hmm. in poetry? Right? Is, that, is that fair to say? Uh -huh. <coughs> I mean, I, I mean, just St. Mark's Church, and it became a repository for all sorts of <laughs> And eventually started the whole dance program. You know? uh -huh. yeah. right. Judson Church dance. generated seven or eight different dance companies. Uh -huh. John Brown and was on and on. Meredith Monk. Similar fourteen. So there are these little mexies, and they all just are like little puffballs that drift off and mm -hmm. poof over in the Lower East Side, or poof downtown, or poof in, in Europe. It's like but it's in the air, and you just feel it and pick it up. Yeah, yeah. yeah. We, we have to remember Charlie Chaplin and uh, that whole crew, mm -hmm. Laurel and Hardy. Mm -hmm. yeah. They were all involved in. Surreal and that I just, we can't we take, can't take the tunis and push them back, you know, into the time when Dada was the dominant aesthetic. Um, but right now, most of the faculty that uh, have this kind of focus are just not getting tenure. Mm -hmm. so, so it's sort of dying mm -hmm. in that way. Mm -hmm. Just turn the world into a, a group of painters. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Well, it was really Thanks. because of Polly um, funding, yes, that I think Rutgers and Douglas was able to do anything because it had been so traditional of them. You know, it was all landscape and, and you know, things. There were a couple of leftover teachers that were there when I was there that were, I felt sorry for them because we all picked on them. Thinking. Bob Bradshaw, and it was a woman, somebody's name I forget now. Uh, and then this exciting new group of people came in, and it was terrific, and students were all excited, but that was a big transitional moment in the school. I think I'd <coughs> like to call it at this point yeah. and give Donna a big, big. I just realized the next big show, and, and Mary and Monk told me that they did a huge Jewish chicken farmer program at the Reformed Church and it was standing room only with a lot of laughs. And so that's coming next. Okay. <laughs>